Hey. You know, the calling of God affects our lives in powerful ways, doesn't it? We begin to think of the calling of God on our lives and, and how it affects us in, in powerful ways. And I think, I think of history, human history, and how it has been orchestrated with people who have lived with the calling of God in their lives and has been shown in powerful ways. Today's Halloween. That's why we're all dressed up. It's Halloween, October 31st. What you may not know is October 31st in human history, almost 500 years ago, Martin Luther stands and posts the 95 Theses. He wrestles with Scripture. Uh, he has what maybe some have called the dark night of the soul. He wrestles with God and Scripture. Uh, would he go against the church at the time? Uh, would he try and bring the church back to reform? And maybe the Reformation begins. Maybe it's the reason that you and I are st sitting here as non-Catholics. And why does he do it? Why does he go into hiding? Why does he go into exile? Because people want to kill him. Uh, because of a powerful calling. We see it in the world. I was thinking the other day as I was watching television... And I was noticing that there were good Christian American doctors that were willing to take their relative security in America, where they are and what they were doing, uh, the relative lucrity of uh, being able to handle a practice in the United States and, and take all of that kind of security and take it over to places in West Africa where there's relative insecurity. To try and help people who are being riddled with a, a disease that could actually not only kill them, but kill other people. And I think, why in the world do people do that? Probably because somewhere, some way, they have this sense of God's directive and the calling on their life to go and do something powerful with it. I think of the church. I think of people that I know and maybe that you know, uh, preachers who would, who would leave larger churches and larger paychecks and a constant income and a security and a comfort of being in one place. And, and, I, and I begin to think of them quitting their jobs and going to hundreds of miles away and taking their families and uprooting everything that they know and going to a place that they don't understand and they don't know so they can go, instead of a church building, they can move into a school cafeteria and they can deal with inadequate sound and inadequate lighting and they can be the servant who sets up the chairs and they can risk everything. Maybe we'd say they were risking their careers from, to go from one place to another and I begin to ask myself why? And it's because they have this sense of drivenness, this calling. There are men and women who dare to live with the kind of purpose that you and I want to emulate because they love the caller and they love his calling and the people around them are influenced in powerful ways. And what you and I need to know this morning, right now, is that calling does matter. It has value and we need to take it in and say that it's important. I was asked a question recently. It was one that kind of planted a rock in my shoe, you know what I mean? And, and it wouldn't go away. It wouldn't go away to such an extent that I've asked some of you the same question. And as I began to ask myself, and I ask you the question, what breaks my heart? began to look over the contour of my life and go, what is it? And then I began to realize what it was that God was doing in me, why I'm here, while you're here. What breaks my heart is ministry leaders who fail or who quit because they abandon the caller or his calling on their life. 
Do you know people who have let go of the call of God? Uh, maybe they thought they could go out and they could make more money somewhere else. Maybe they wanted a simpler life. Maybe they just simply wanted not to have to get their hands dirty uh, with the messiness that sometimes comes with being in ministry and dealing with the problems of people. Maybe it was uh, that they didn't want to be a constant grace extension to other people and they said, no more, I'm going to go to jobs.com and find something else. And they look at the greener grass on the other side of the road and they say, that's, that's really what I want. And so they go to GoDaddy.com and they go to the want ads and those things become the enemy to their calling. And the tragedy, the tragedy is they take their Porsche and they trade it in for a Kia. They take their brand new iPhone and they say, I'll take that 1980 bag phone, please. The tragedy is that they become cell phone retail store operators. They become people who deliver the mail. They become investment advisors and they sell insurance and they're friendly store managers at the local store. But they've abandoned God's calling on their life. This morning, I, I want to examine with you what it means to be called by God. And I want to do that in a unique way. I, I want to bring from the pages of Scripture a character that knows an awful lot about calling and the caller. And I want to bring him here to the NC stage. So will you welcome Jeremiah to the stage? Hey, NC, my name is Jeremiah. I uh, have been able to spend a few weeks now in the 21st century, and let me tell you, 3,000 years makes quite a bit of difference in the world, you know? I mean, I remember uh, in dark nights, I would have to uh, try and read by the just slimmest of candlelight, and now suddenly you walk into a room and lights are coming on. Electricity is a wonderful thing. But it's not just electricity. I found uh, that many of you have these little talking boxes. You talk into them and you hear things out of them. It's amazing. You can amplify sound in your worship time. You have these funny little wires that are connected to little boxes that you stick in your ears. I've not quite figured that one out yet, uh, but it's amazing. You take these little boxes and you can answer all sorts of questions. All you say is, okay, Google now. And all the questions you ever wanted answered are answered by Google. I was really excited to get to know some of your professors. They introduced me to Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. And I, I learned all about the etiquette of Twitter. I never would have known about the double hashtag otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> but enough about our differences. Let's talk about our similarities. I want to talk to you about the God of the universe the caller and his calling, because it still happens. God is still the caller, and he's still calling people to come and to work and to serve with him. I mean, uh, take me, for example. What you may not know is I was, I was just a kid. I was about 13 years old. I was in this culture, uh, this terribly dark time of, of history. The people uh, that were supposed to be uh, the covenant people that, that had this great relationship with God, uh, they had traded it in. And it, they had decided to go with deception instead of truth. Politically, there were all kinds of kings. They were to be uh, the, the cup bearers of what faithfulness was supposed to look like. And yet, uh, they, they were constantly deceived. 
Manasseh, oh, he poisoned the well for everybody after him. Maybe outside of Josiah, the boy king who tried to reform Israel and take them back into this relationship. Everything was broken. The people had decided to to hand in their relationship with God for a pseudo-spirituality of religion that would allow them to justify any kind of lewd behavior they wanted. And there I was. I was to pronounce loudly and longly and clearly God's message. There was a time, you know, when I was looking at that dark culture and I thought, well, I could easily be a light to that. You probably know about dark cultures, don't you? Perhaps there was even a time as a young child that that you thought, I could be a light to that. I'm not frightened. Well, there was a time for me for that. I mean, I was a PK. Any PKs in the house? I was a priest's kid. I knew all about the Torah. I hung out at the temple. I had more network connections than Dave Miller has Twitter followers. I knew. (laughs) I knew all about this covenant relationship that was supposed to be taking place. And and I recognized it as a young age. And even eight and nine, I was like that little Power Ranger kid that I saw wandering the streets yesterday. And my cry as I went to my room was, yeah, God! I would be the light in this frighteningly dark world. Let me at them, God. Well, that was before God called me. I don't know that I could tell you just exactly what I was doing or, or where I was, but I know the words will always be with me. The words are frighteningly etched into my memory forever. Jeremiah, I formed you. Jeremiah, I know you. Jeremiah, I've set you apart. And I am appointing you. He went on and he said, I'm appointing you to be a prophet to the nations, to tear down, to uproot, to destroy. There was no confetti falling from the ceiling. There was no bright lights in my room. I mean, Moses got a burning bush for crying out loud. He got a magic stick. I didn't even get how to be a prophet for dummies. (laughs) And there I was with the weight of God's call sitting on my shoulders, the words hanging like, like planets on strings. And my once vibrant, youthful, yeah, God, it turned to, yeah, God about this whole message thing, about this whole prophet thing. I'm not sure that I can quite understand what you're asking me to do. I mean, after all, God, I'm only 13 years old. And I don't know if you know this, God, but when I get in front of large bodies of people, I, my voice begins to crack. I'm not sure if I can begin to do this. I sat with the words hanging on my shoulders for days. My stomach ached. The hardest part about it is I knew who I was going to have to go to. You see, Amos, the prophet, he got to go from the southern kingdom to the northern kingdom. Uh, He got to go to a people where he could live in anonymity. No, I didn't get that. I had to go to my people. I had to go to people that I had looked at, that I had grown up with, that they knew me. They had my Twitter account. I had seen their pictures on Facebook. And I had to go to them. 
God said, you have to go where I tell you to go. And you have to say what I tell you to say. Tear down, uproot, destroy. And I had to take that to people that I'd brushed shoulders with, that I'd been in the marketplace with, and I had to bring God's message of destruction and pray that they would hear it. Do you know what it's like to be called? Do you know what it's like to be called? To have God's presence and sense of movement in your life in such a powerful way uh, that you know the direction that he's asking you to go, that the, your life is, is pointed in a direction and that you know that you need to go there, but every fiber of your being wants to look back up at God, the sovereign creator over all things, and say, I know this time, God, that you must have made a mistake because I'm too young. Because the road is too long. Because the task that you're asking me to do is too hard. God, I can't do it. You do know, don't you? You know because you're the chosen ones, aren't you? You've been called and commissioned and appointed and you know that kind of direction that God places on your life. You know that, that you weren't called just to sit in another church pew or a church chair somewhere. That you were called with this, this appointment of leadership and ministry and full-time vocational leadership where you get in with your hands and you, you get dirty. Oh, inadequacy. Inadequacy doesn't even begin to touch the kinds of feelings that we have when God calls us into those kinds of roles, does it? The mountains that he sets before us for the things that he's asking us to do, tear down, uproot, destroy. Can I tell you just how many times I had people coming over to my house to give me invitation to the National Prophets Conference? Can I ask you how many times uh, do you think I had invitations to go speak at YIY, Yahweh and Youth? <laughs> I didn't have any. By the time I was done, by the time my life was over, it was beatings jeerings, mockings. You see, I had to, to learn early on that as I wrestled with this calling of God in my life, uh, that the calling of God often comes with challenges and circumstances that I don't know if I can overcome. Sometimes the road is hard and long and tough. It's not exactly a, a warm, fuzzy a robe that I can slip myself into. It's, it's not a heated leather seat. If you're accepting this appointment, then I want you to know the challenges that are before you. On one occasion, I was going as the Lord had led me to. He said, I want you to go to the potter's house. It was another oracle of judgment. It was going to be another message of, of me trying to preach the devastation of God's judgment. Uh, but I wanted to give the opportunity for unfaithful people to come back into this relationship with God. It was about them returning to who God was. And yet this hard thing to the people that I knew that I, I had friended all of my life, they just were not listening And I have to be honest, I whined at God. It probably sounded me blubbering in my room like, God, 
Why? Why is it that I have to be here? You told me that you were going to protect me, that you would rescue me if I answered your call. And here I am, and I'm doing your work, and there's those enemies out there, and they're not doing what, what they're supposed to be doing, and I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, and, and where are you? You're persecuting me, and you're letting them go. I'm in prison and in the pit and being beaten in stocks, and they're your enemies. I thought it was unfair. There I am, sitting in darkness and loneliness, depressed, wondering where in the world God was going to take me next if this was the end of it. And they got Free Dish Network and an a all-you-can-eat buffet at Red Lobster. All right, I made up the part about Dish Network. You know what it's like when people won't listen? I mean, you know it's the truth because it came directly from God and you're giving it to them with all the passion that you can muster and you're trying to give them the truth. They look at you as strange and odd. When I went to speak judgment that day, they wouldn't listen. I was talking with one of your professors recently, and, and his name escapes me. But I do know that he was a rather physical specimen. He was tall. Blonde hair, blue eyes, rather muscular. <laughs> I can't remember what his name was, but you'll be able to place him, I'm sure. And he told me a story of ministry on his lips. He said he went to this church. He had inherited this small, dying church that lacked direction and had questionable leadership. It was a small church in a small town. The church wasn't small because it was in a small town. It was small because uh, there were people there in the church that, that had a hard time seeing past the corner to be able to try and see the kingdom. There's Google again. And so, one year went by, and two years went by, all the while he's grinding away, and there began to be new leaders and new people, and three years went by, and four years, and five years, and, and eventually uh, there became to be began a swell uh, just of, of God's movement and His kingdom and people wanted to see something else and something bigger, but there had to be something more. There had to be something life-changing and transformational. We had to create crisis. So they began to pray, God, what would, it, what would you have us do? How would you have us act? And they came up with this, this crazy, unheard of, unthinkable idea at that particular time in that particular place in rural America. We'll merge with another church. We'll become a multi-site rural church. And so they... They found a church not too far. It was healthy. It was larger. Uh, they began to, to, to talk with the, the leadership of that particular congregation. And they said, hey, we've got this outlandish, crazy, unheard of, unthinkable idea. And they said, that sounds really good. And so over the next two years... Yeah, that's right. Two years, they began to, to strategize and they began to gather together and they began to pray over what God would do. And so by the time the two years had ended, you have two leaderships of these two churches uh, looking uh, together at the kingdom and saying, God is definitely here. But it needed a vote. And on that day... The larger church said yes, and this younger church, this smaller church, said no. 
I'd like to tell you that when you're called by God, the people will always listen, but oftentimes they won't. I would like to tell you that after the tough messages that I preach to those people day after day, uh, talking about judgment, uh, trying to get them to return to the Lord, that, that people came up regularly afterwards and said, oh, Jeremiah, it's okay. I know that you uh, preached your heart out today. I know that it was hard to preach a message of destruction instead of peace, so good job. I wish I could tell you that I had gone to my mailbox and there was a card in it uh, with a, a phrase something like this, Jeremiah, we'd be in a crunch without you with a taped little uh, chocolate bar to tell me how much I'm appreciated. <laughs> but usually, usually it wasn't any of that. When the people didn't listen to me, I usually got beat. So I come back, come back to you. I come back to ideas of you being chosen. You see, you'll pray for your people just like I prayed. And, and, and maybe they will listen and maybe they won't. And maybe you'll have, uh, uh, maybe you'll have a, a, a message of judgment or maybe you'll have a message of salvation. But when the road gets tough, and the journey gets long, and the task gets hard, what will you do? Can I make a suggestion? If you're on a journey in which you feel inadequate, where the task is hard and the road is long. The only thing that's going to keep you in the game is your loyalty to the caller and his calling. You're the called. You're the chosen. You're the appointed. You're the overcomer. You're the saint and the disciple and the leader. You want to hang on? You want to stand up and stand firm? Then you follow the caller and you obey his calling because the calling will galvanize your commitment. Will you pray with me? God, you're unbelievable. I pray for all those within earshot of my voice that we will live according to the word that you have given us and obey you, the caller and the calling you've given. Our life is yours. No matter how tough the road gets, in Jesus' name.